let's assume that you, when your child is born, someone, aunt, el, uh, uncle, uh, grandma, grandpa, somebody gives you $50,000 and you put it in your retirement or you've saved $50,000 and you put it in your retirement and you invest it wisely in index funds with low expenses, uh, even if it's in a taxable account and you make 10% a year, that return of $50,000 from the times of the child's birth until they're 20, which you know is in the first year or two. I tried to pick a middle date. Maybe this is a, one year too far. We could have that discussion. But by the time the child is 20, that portfolio could grow to $336,000. If instead you put it in a 529, assuming they have uh, mutual funds that underperform the market by 2%, now, like I said, most are 2.2 to 2.5, but let's say 2%, and that covers the fees and the expenses uh, that they might charge. And then the, one of the problems is that as the student gets closer to college, you have to start, well, you don't have to, you should start investing more and more conservatively because in when the child turns eight, you know in about 10 years, you're going to start taking money out. And just like retirement planning, you now have a target date. You want to start being a little more cautious, not wildly more. So I changed the rate of return from 8% that year to 7.5. Because what you don't want to have happen is six months before the student goes to college and you have to pay the first college bills is that your account falls 20, 30, or like 2008, 37% in one calendar year, and now you're forced to sell low. So you want to reduce that risk, so you start investing more and more conservatively. Some state-sponsored 529 plans do that for you automatically, and you do not have a choice. Some will not do that automatically, but you should still do it on your own. Now, you could argue that you could leave it at more risk, but then, like I said, you might lose 20, 25%. Just happens to be the year that you have to start taking money out and you've destroyed a whole lot of the benefit you are going to get if you could even use the 529 plan. So we slowly get down to lower and lower rate of returns until we're getting down to about uh, today's uh, market rate, which may be different in the future. So, I mean, this is just a practice in mathematics just for fun. And that money turns into uh, $161,000 at the age of 20 for the student. Definitely could pay a good chunk, if not all, of four years of college. No doubt about it. But the money that was in your IRAs or 401ks would not count for college expenses at all. And it would be $336,000. So, the difference, of course, between the two is 336 minus $161,000, a difference of $175,000. And most of that comes from the fact that you're getting better investment options in your money and you can keep investing it for the long term and taking on that greater risk and therefore, we at least hope, the higher rate of return. So under those assumptions, that $50,000 could turn into 336 or 161. Now we can argue back and forth about some of the assumptions and the details, but hopefully no one argues that you shouldn't at least be a little more conservative as you get closer to college for the savings account. And that's the really big factor in, in a lot of this. So maybe the difference is not 175. Maybe it's only 100,000. I don't have an extra 100000 I want to give up. So if you are following one of my other key points of advice of saving 20% per year for retirement, let's assume between you or you and your spouse, you make $100,000. And if your amount is different, of course, you can adjust for this, and you're saving $20,000 a year uh, for your retirement through your 401ks, IRAs. When the first child goes to college, you can stop saving for your retirement and instead spend $20,000 in real time on college bills if you choose to do that and if you need to do that. 
every family's method for paying for college differs. The way we set it up with our children, we set a fixed amount per year that we would contribute. And then we assume they would get um, a Stafford loan or a little bit of government loan at a reasonable interest rate. We assume that they could work some. I mean, I'm not, they're not going to have a full-time job necessarily, but maybe they can make five or eight or $10,000 to offset their bills. And maybe on top of that, they still have to borrow a few thousand dollars. And the idea is that uh, maybe they have five or 10 or 20 or $40,000 of debt when they're out of college. Um, my son at one point was looking at a, another college and it cost $20,000 more per year. And he came to me and he said, who pays that extra amount? And I said, well, well you do. And he said, well, 20,000 a year times four years is $80,000 extra. What am I getting for $80,000? And I said, that's a really good question. I don't have the answer for that. So that gets them to start thinking about controlling college costs. My daughter came to me and she said, if I go to community college for two years and then switch to a more expensive, fancier name school, when I graduate from that school, where does the degree show it's from? And I said, from the fancier school. And she said, if I go all four years and don't spend all the money you have committed, what happens to that money? And the amount of money is generous, but it's not that big. And I told her if she could complete a four-year degree and still have money left over, I would hand it to her. So now she starts thinking about how to control costs and how to get things done. And maybe they spend a little more time and effort seeking out other means of financial aid because on paper, it looks like they don't have a lot of money. And the government assumes on the FAFSA that you can pull a huge amount out of your cash flow from your income anyway, so why not do that? And while they're in college, and if you have one, two, three students, and maybe you have to stop saving for retirement for several years, all of that money, all of that 20% that you had saved for 20 years now keeps growing. That's one of the perks of saving 20% is that if something comes up and you need to stop for a few years, you can still be okay. 10% will take you 40 years if you never miss. 20% might take 25 years, maybe a little less if things go really well for you. Maybe a little longer if things don't work out exactly right, but you still have a chance to make up for it. So there's some thoughts about saving for college. The one thing that just popped in, <clears throat> into my head, excuse me, if you make a whole lot of money, 150, 200 or more per year, because you and your significant other both work, you probably are not going to get aid anywhere anyway. You could consider a 529. They're not horrible, but the problem is what happens if they do get a scholarship for academic achievement or sports or music or some other skill that they have in that college once you've still got the problem of getting the money out paying the 10 percent penalty because you didn't use it for college i hate penalties on my money so i want to try to avoid them so all those things together kind of lean me really strongly that for most people you should not put money in a 529 you should focus on your retirement and one of the examples i often tell people I'm assuming most of my listeners have at some point been on an airplane. When the, the steward or stewardess, flight assistant, flight attendant, whatever the proper word is today, talks about the oxygen mask dropping down. They tell you all the time, if there's a child with you, you put the mask on yourself first, and then you can help your child. It's the same thing with money. If you have not saved for retirement, it is very difficult for you to help your child. And I have come across people that have worked very hard. And then when their student goes to college, they clear out their own investment accounts to pay for college. And when the student gets done, they're now pushing 50, you know, maybe sometimes 45 ish, but maybe sometimes 55 ish. And now you have 15 years to start saving for retirement. That is very, very hard to do. You've given up all that time value of money. Remember your student, uh, you want them to keep the debt down, but they will have 40, 50 years to pay it off and start saving on their own. So I understand because I am a parent. I want to help as much as possible. If you save and invest 
and you end up with more money than you really need. And, and I know some people have a hard time with that, but I do believe in the philosophy of enough. Uh, you could always help pay off their bills if you've done really well for yourself and your money's grown really well. And it's easier for it to grow when you have money. That's the first step of how to money. You have to save. You have to spend less than you make. The second step is investing. The third step is time. And so that's how I look at all of this stuff. And I've gone on much longer than I expected. So I'm going to wrap up here and we're going to take a little commercial break. And then when we come back, we're going to listen to the interview with Mark White. This is Phil Ferguson with Polaris Financial Planning, the home of science-based investing. I see people owning really bad investments all of the time. Many advisors are paid a commission by a big company to sell you something you may not need. It's kind of like church. They create fear, then they tell you what you want to hear, and then they take your money. What you want is an advisor that is paid only by you. That is a fee-only fiduciary advisor. Remember, people work for who they are paid by. You can contact me, Phil, at PolarisFinancialPlanning.com or listen to the cleverly titled The Phil Ferguson Show. Each show, we have an interesting investing skeptically topic and an interview with someone fighting to end religion. Polaris also gives 10% of gross revenue to support the growing secular movement. You're not just getting better investments, you're helping to change the world. Only on Secular Media Network. All right, everybody, welcome back. This is Phil Ferguson, and of course, you are listening to the cleverly titled Phil Ferguson Show. As promised today, I've got my very special guest. And matter of fact, I'm pretty sure he's the first person to ever own a gold record to be on my show. Uh, it is Mark White. How are you, sir? I'm doing great. How are you? I, I am doing good. And we were talking a little bit pre-show. As you know, I'm on the board for the Reason Rally, but I am not on the committee that's getting speakers. So I only found out a few weeks before the public that you're going to come to the Reason Rally. How did that happen? Uh, well, I talked to David Silver. He was just, we were just talking on Facebook and he was trying to get the spin doctors to do it, but how'd that it just go? Didn't, yeah, didn't, it didn't really work out. And so it was no big deal. You know, we're, I'm a chill person and I was just, I just woke up one morning and, and he had, I am to me. He was like, Hey, I'm going to get you to speak at the reason rally. And I'm like, no freaking way. That's so, very cool. So he, uh, I guess I got to come up with a speech for eight minutes. You know, normally I just do them on the fly, but I think I might actually write something. Not, you know, not be a putz. And I, just I don't remember who said it, and maybe one of my listeners can help me out, but there's apparently some famous quote where someone was asked to speak, and they said, well, if you want me to speak all day, I can start right now. Uh, if you want me to speak for two hours, uh, I'll need a few minutes to think about it. And if you want me to speak for 10 minutes, I'm going to need several days to prepare. And right. that's where you are. You've got eight minutes. I've got eight minutes. Eight minutes. You, you, so you walk out, hopefully not in pouring rain like four years ago. Right. And you've got eight minutes to talk in front of 50,000 people. Oh, man, I'm so nervous. <laughs> that's okay. There's going to be millions at home watching it. I'm even more nervous now. Actually, I don't. I don't get nervous. Yeah, I, I figured you've been in front of a crowd or two before. Yes, but I mean, the biggest crowd we ever been in front of, I think, was some festival. I can't remember, Glastonbury or Woodstock or yeah, what's the other one? Opening for the Rolling Stones. I mean, that that was a big. Those deal. those were big. But I'm just playing. You know, I'm playing the bass. I don't have to do anything. I'm just. But I'm so excited to you know to to be in to be a free thinker, an atheist or whatever, and. Just to get attention for that is almost as amazing as getting attention for playing the bass, if not more, maybe. So uh, for my listeners who don't know who you are, and shame on them, uh, a matter of fact, I would even imagine a few of my younger listeners, and forgive me for saying this, might not even know who the Spin Doctors is. Now, if anybody, if anybody saw Deadpool... They they know who we are now. They know. They because know, he made fun of us. And he was like, oh. he said something horrible. I don't know what it was. <laughs> well, what what is that old saying? Uh, no such thing as bad publicity. Right. But I'm not. I'm not easily offended. That's the reason why I'm the way I am today. 
that that has a lot to do with it. And why don't you give us just a couple of minutes and talk about 